When I was nine years old, I moved uh, from the place that I had really only ever known. I, I moved to Jackson, Mississippi when I was two years old. And, and so when I was nine years old, uh, my dad just got a different job and I, and I moved away um, to a new city. And um, this is a story that I don't think I've ever told publicly. And so I wanted to be able to relay that to you. And like all kids who moved, I had to start a new life. I had to get new friends. If you've ever moved, you, you know, many of you, some of you might even be visiting because you're looking for a new church, uh, a new school, all of those different things that go along with, with moving uh, as a kid. And so um, uh, I was kind of a small kid. I might not be that small anymore, but I was a small kid. I, I, I joke around about it now. I call myself the runt of my litter, uh, even though there was only two of us. It was my sister and me, but I was a rail. Um, I really hadn't, I really wasn't muscular or anything like that. And so uh, I was just a, a little small guy. And so I started, I remember I started fourth grade in, in my new school. And, and I've always liked sports, but I've never been good at sports. Anybody in here like, like that? You, you kind of you like them, but you just really stink at them. You get out there and uh, you play basketball or football. You just kind of flounder and kind of make a fool of yourself and so I've always kind of liked them but but never really been uh good at those and and it became apparent over a series of time that I realized I was not part of the in group at this new place at this new city that I had uh moved and so uh you know one of the things that, that God has, has gifted me and especially in that day and age you know being nine years old many of you have kids that are that age I mean give me a bucket of Legos you know, and, and I'll, I'll build you a battleship or, a, or a, a flying, you know, something, something amazing. But give me a bucket of Legos. I'm really good. My, my mother was uh, a librarian, and uh, she later got her master's and, and became a professional storyteller. And so I think uh, maybe, maybe a little bit of that rubbed off uh, on me. But I enjoyed doing things like drama and whatnot. But that wasn't one of the things that was very popular at the, at the school that I was at. And so... Um, even though I enjoyed acting, I realized that I was different from many of the other kids. And, and as time went on, they seemed to notice as well. And um, what unfolded in my nine-year-old and ten-year-old life was, um, was being bullied. And I know a lot of that is on the news this day, and, and we talk about being bullied in this day and age. But it really wasn't that popular of a topic back then. As many of you know, kids can be so harsh. Um, they can be so mean, not realizing the, the things that they say. And, 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 and I wanted so bad. I don't know if you've ever been this. You might even be like this in your adult life. I wanted so bad just to be like everybody else. I wanted so badly just to, just to be in that group and have a place of belonging. I don't know if you've ever been to this place before. Have you ever been in a room of people, maybe as a young person or even as, as an adult, and you just feel totally alone? Have you ever felt like that? And that's just, I, I remember feeling that constantly. And, and I remember trying to talk to some adults and, and, and tell them about some of the things that I was experiencing and, and the, the bullying that I, that I went through. And, and a, a lot of it just had to do with words people would say from time to time. It was, it was actions, um, you know, occasionally being pushed or something like that. But mostly it was the words that, that people uh, would use. And I just remember how much it was cutting me. And, and as I told a few adults, I, I remember what they said. A lot of them just said... Dan, just ignore them. Just ignore them. And let me ask you that. Let me ask you a question. Is it easy when people are saying things about you, mean things? Is it, is it easy to ignore? Absolutely not. It's not easy to ignore. I think a lot of people, I think they were just thinking maybe it's just youth or kids. And, and, and maybe they just didn't realize how, um, how deep it was cutting me. And, and it's hard to ignore when people are so malicious sometimes. And over time in my fourth grade year, and that might sound young, but a depression set in in my life. And I don't even know if I can explain it, to be honest with you. Um, it was a feeling of worthlessness. Um, and in that midst of that time, I began to contemplate what the world would look like without me. I began to think about, you know, obviously a lot of these kids don't want me. What would the world look like without me? And, I, and I've heard all kinds of ridiculous things that people have said about bullying. Uh, and until you've walked in someone's shoes who's been bullied, you know, just, 
just do your best to understand. I, 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 I've heard some folks say, well, why don't you stand up to them? Why don't, you, why don't you knock their teeth out? Well, first of all, you're trying to be friends with them, okay? Knocking their teeth out doesn't exactly, you know, make you in, in the in group. Not to mention when you're about this big around, you know, you don't stand a chance at all. And so I just remember those, those feelings uh, of being smaller and not near as athletic in it. And at 10 years old, I was hospitalized for two separate weeks because the only way that I could see the end of my feelings of pain and the end of my feelings of worthlessness was to end my life. And so this morning, I want to talk about depression. I think a lot of times it's kind of put on the side. I think a lot of times it's a topic that people don't talk about. But I just want to give you a few statistics this morning. Major depressive disorder affects approximately 15 million American adults and about 7% of the U.S. population age 18 and older in any given year. As many as 1 in 33 children, 1 in 33 children, now listen to this, and 1 in 8 adolescents don't just have mild depression, but have clinical depression. People with depression are four times as likely to develop a heart attack than those without a history of illness. Depression, listen to this, this blew me away. Depression is the cause of over two-thirds of the 30,000 reported suicides in the U.S. each year. This will blow you away. For every two homicides committed in the United States, there are three suicides. Do you get upset when you see things on the news and you hear about homicide? I mean, does that upset you? For every two homicides, there are three suicides. Suicide is the third leading cause of death in 15 to 24-year-olds. The third leading cause of death for teenagers and young adults. It's the fourth leading cause of death. Are you ready for this? The fourth leading cause of death for, for kids aged 10 to 14. The fourth leading cause of death with little ones, like I was. Young males aged 15 to 24 are at highest risk for suicide with a ratio of males to females, seven to one. Although, when, when you look at the statistics, females uh, live with their depression more than males. The, D the Center for Disease Control reports that the death rate from suicide remains higher than the death rate for chronic liver disease, Alzheimer's, homicide, and arteriosclerosis or hypertension. And as I was doing a little bit of research and as I was looking at, at depression, do you realize that, that even some of the people in our world, some of the, some of the greatest leaders in our world in, in the past have had depression? Let me just list off a couple of them for you. Some of the greatest military leaders, statesmen, musicians, uh, scientists, theologians have been victims of depression, including Winston Churchill. Anybody heard of that guy? George Frederick Handel, he was a composer. Edgar Allan Poe, Napoleon Bonaparte, Vincent Van Gogh, and the Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. All of these guys dealt with depression. And so I think that seeing this, I think that it deserves our time this morning. I think that it deserves, even though this is a sobering topic and a serious topic, I think that God wants to speak to us this morning about the topic of depression and being free from depression and getting away from this and, and living the life that God has called us to live in freedom. Is there freedom? And so if you got your notes, I want you to pull them out because there's a couple of things that I want us to look at, I want us to define, and I want you to grab a pen if you got one and we'll, we'll write some of these things down. Our sound booth is going to help us as we put some of these slides up there. So this morning I want to start out, let's just define depression. Let's, let's define what it is. Now, there's all different types of depression. Let me tell you, there are all different types of depression. And there's different ways of looking at it. There, there's uh, a season of depression, you know, uh, some people will call it situational, some people are depressed with bipolar polar disorder they go up they go down uh, and so there's all different types of depression and so I, I don't want to I don't want to just niche this into uh, one small thing because I think that we could probably take several weeks but I, I just want to take one week in particular so so let's define depression on, on a broad scale okay so this might not fit uh, every situation but on a broad scale this is what we're looking at a feeling of hopelessness 
accompanied by consistent negative thoughts. A feeling of hopelessness accompanied, well, you have this one as defeat as its root. You could also write that down. But go ahead and put a feeling of hopelessness accompanied by negative thoughts. As we talk about anxiety, we talked about anxiety two weeks ago. We talked about anxiety two weeks ago, and we said that anxiety was a feeling of helplessness, okay? It was a feeling of helplessness, but here's what depression is, a feeling of hopelessness, okay? That feeling of hopelessness, like things aren't going to get better, and so there might be consistent thoughts over feelings of hurt or anger. Maybe you feel incompetent in a lot of areas, lacking worth, guilt, shame, worthlessness, helplessness. And so the bottom line that that I want us to feel is that it's a feeling of absolute hopelessness when you feel hopeless. And and my my wife and I went went back and forth with this because my wife is a counselor. And so, of course, I'm talking to her about all these different things. And she said, Dan, let me tell you, the majority of the people that come into my office that that we counsel for depression, she said the reason they, they feel depressed, the reason that they're coming in is they're feeling hopelessness because of guilt or shame of something that has happened in their life so that guilt that shame that 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 has taken place that they can't seem to get rid of and and if you've ever dealt with depression or maybe you kind of want to maybe you're coming here this morning you want to understand a little better it's almost like you're underwater and 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 you know that if you're underwater you know life would be better if you could just get above the water and take a breath a life-giving breath But in the midst of all that, you feel like you're under this water, you're under this weight, and it's exhausting, and you've been fighting for so long, and you just know if you could just take a breath, but you just can't get there. And the feelings of sinking just kind of get you further and further down. The problem with people who have chronic depression is that many of them have tunnel vision. And, and, and so they can't, they can't see the world. That, that, that depression kind of works uh, almost as blinders. And they can't see the world as God made it to be seen. And so sometimes when you're talking with someone who might have depression, they're just not following along with you. They're, they're just not, they're, they're not there because they can't see. They've kind of been, been blinded. And they've got this lens. Remember, we've been talking of hopelessness. They've got this lens of hopelessness and negative thoughts. And I believe believe that all of this is rooted in the lies of the devil. All of this is rooted in the lies of the devil. And there's so many different lies that, that Satan will whisper in your ears. Those, those feelings of worthlessness or, or you, man, you've done too much. You've gone too far. People don't like you. People will never like you. He whispers all these different lies into our ears. But I think if we could really just kind of narrow it down to one, uh, one general lie that he is whispering in our ears. I just want us to put this up on the screen. And as we define the lie, here's what I want us to see. Number two, let's define the lie. It's the belief that I am not valuable. It's the belief that I am not valuable. And so I believe that that's, that's exactly what Satan is whispering in so many ears. Maybe even in your ear this morning. It says that, that you're not valuable. That life would be better without you. I know in my life when I think back to those, when I think back to those times, I think back of, of that struggle I just thought, man, my my life wasn't valued. Even as a 10-year-old, thinking, man, is my life really worth value? Am I going to deal with this bullying my entire life? Do I even want to put up with this? Is my life even that valuable? And I think David kind of spoke into this. And I just want to read a a passage. It's not out of Matthew 11. We're about to get there in just a second. But I just want to read this out of Psalms 139, 13 through 16. This is what David said talking to God he said for you created my inmost being you knit me together in my mother's womb you you know that this is one one reason that that um that I'm not uh, that I'm pro-life is because uh, the the scriptures talk about God knitting a child together in the mother's womb and then he goes on he says listen I praise you I praise you God because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
And then he goes and he uses that word again. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And so David is just praising God. He's saying, look, your works are wonderful. When you made me, man, you, you, did, you did a great job. Thank you, God, so much for making me. You do wonderful works. And then he talks about, again, that, that, that idea of being in the womb. He says, my frame was not hidden from you. When I was, when I was made in the secret place, and when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, and when the lights go off, no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead and get those back off so you, you, can, you can see. When my frame was hidden from you, and when I was made together in the secret place, we did that for effect, by the way, the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Now look at, li listen, just listen to this. Your eyes saw my unformed body all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Did you know that your life, your life was written in God's book? God knew exactly what your life was going to look like. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. I mean, this is, this is in Scripture. So, Pastor Dan, what are you trying to say? If you, could, if you could put all of this together, what does that mean? It means simply this. God doesn't create junk. God doesn't create junk. You are not junk. Yes, we live in a sinful world where there is pain, but God doesn't create junk. And I want you to hear that this morning. That, that I, I think of, of all the things that, that I have done, and I think about um, even the times that I've worked in the business world. Many of you guys work in the business world. And so many of you guys handle money. I know that. And, and so you handle different money, whether you're a cashier or whether uh, you, you work at a place where you're taking money to the bank or, or whatever. Many of you guys handle money. And in and, and several of my jobs, I've had to handle money. And let me tell you, I have been handed all kinds of money. I've been handed $20 bills that are crisp and clean and straight out of the bank. But you know what, I, in my job, and if you've worked with money too, you've been, handed, you've been handed money that's been wadded up, wet. If you work down in the French Quarter, sweaty, dirty, torn, and all taped up. Anybody ever had a, had a dollar, or maybe you did it, you taped the dollar bill up. You said, oh my goodness, I gotta, I gotta tape this thing up. But do you know how much that, that $20 bill is worth? How much is that $20 bill worth? $20, right? Whether it's crisp or clean or whether it has been wadded up, dirty, and torn apart. That $20 bill is still worth $20. And here's what I want us to understand as we're looking into this and as we're getting ready to dive into Matthew chapter 11. In God's eyes, maybe not in our eyes, but in God's eyes, the condition of your life, the condition, wadded up, messed up, no matter what kind of past you have, the condition of your life never equals the value of your life. The condition of your life, no matter what you've been through, never equals the value of your life. I love this, and this is one of the most famous verses in, in our church, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Do you hear it? All conditions, all people. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You have been created in the image of God, and so Jesus Christ died for you so that he could take away your sin, so that, so that you can live with him forever. And so I want us to see this morning as we look into Matthew chapter 11, very quickly, I want you to look with me in Matthew chapter 11 at what God says about this topic of depression and this topic of, of, of feeling the weight and the heaviness of life. In verse 25, it says, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Let me kind of fill you in on what's going on. There were people that would follow God and they just wanted to be spectators of Jesus. 
They just wanted to be spectators. They just wanted to watch the miracles. They just wanted to see, as many of you know, if, if you've kind of been taught about the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they, they just wanted to kind of follow Jesus around. They're trying to figure out who he was. And so uh, they hadn't committed their lives to him. And so they had all this head knowledge, but they, they hadn't sunk down into their heart. And so Jesus, Jesus thanks God. And he says, God, thank you so much that there's people that have all this head knowledge, but you've taught this to people without the head knowledge. You taught it to people with faith like a child. In verse 27, he says, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then it's going to come in here, don't miss this, in verse 28. And we're going to see, I want us to see who Jesus is revealing the Father to. Let's see the type of people that Jesus is revealing God the Father to. And it's this type of people in verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Literally, that word rest means relief. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so here's what I want us to see. When we're talking about God's truth, I want us to just identify three simple things about God's truth as it's talking about the weight of the world being upon us. Here's what I want us to see. The very first thing that you've got in your notes, the very first piece of truth that that God wants to uh, play effect in your life is this. Jesus says, come to me. He says, come to me. Now, did you see that? You don't want things to come to you if you don't value them, okay? And what what does Jesus say? He says, come to me if you're weary and you're burdened. Man, are you exhausted? Jesus says, come to me. Are you lonely? Jesus says, come to me. Are you filled with the guilt and the shame of your past? Come to me. Do you feel helpless? Do you feel worthless? Come to me. Are you a negative person? Come to me. Are you depressed? Come to me. Have you been considering self-destruction? Come to me. I, I, wanna, I just want to tell you something that's going to free your soul up this morning. It's going to free you. I wanna, I, I'm telling you, this is, this is going to pull the burden off so many of you this morning. And it's simply this. You have nothing to offer God. Amen? You have nothing to offer God. That's good news. It's good news that we simply have nothing. He's got everything. He holds everything. He doesn't need anything from you. There is nothing that you have that you can offer God. So stop trying and come to him and let him hold you. He says, come to me. You have nothing to offer me. Let me put my arms around you. Let me give you rest. Let me give you my joy and my hope. I I think about... us coming to him and, and in those, those, those times of when I, when I was 10 years old and feeling all of that depression, all of that weight and going through that, that tough time and then two years later I go to a camp like these kids go to and, and what's amazing is I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior at age 12 and you know what, what happened in my life? I'm telling you, the weight just came off that much more. A joy came in through the power of the Holy Spirit, a supernatural, not a natural, supernatural joy and hope and peace came in sure I got saved sure I was going to go to heaven after I made that decision to surrender my life but he gave me an unspeakable joy that I had never experienced before why did that happen because I came to him and he gave me rest the second thing that I want you to write down is this Jesus says take the life that I have for you. That's the Dan Pritchett version of of this next part. Jesus says, take the life that I have for you. If you read in verse 28, it says this. Uh, It says, well, verse 29, it says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart. And then it goes on in verse 30, it says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take my yoke upon you. What, What is that talking about? What in the world does that mean? Does that mean crack an egg and put it on you? 
Is that, is, that what the, is that what the yoke means? No, this is a totally different type of yoke. I, I tell you what, guys, how about we put this, uh, this uh, picture up here on the screen, and I want you to see what kind of yoke this is talking about. This is a yoke that, that, that bound the oxen together for the purpose of plowing a field, okay? And so what happened was, as we put it up on the screen, as we put it up on the screen, as, is that it prevented chafing to the animal. And so here's what, so a yoke was something that put two, it's not working, okay, no problem. So, so what happened is it, it put two, uh, it, two things around the animal's neck. And so you have these two oxen that are, that are going, and so it's preventing this chafing, and it binds them together. But the primary reason that a yoke was put on the cattle was so that their master could guide their steps. So you've got this yoke, picture it if you will, okay, that goes around these two oxen's neck, and so it's binding them together. But then what happens is it makes it so that the master can guide their life. And so what Jesus is saying here is he's saying, take my yoke upon you. In verse 30, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what that word easy means? That word easy simply means this, it fits well. It fits well. And so all the things that cause us depression, all the thoughts that consume you, let me ask you this, do they fit well? No, they don't fit well. And what God wants to do is he wants to put, he wants to put a yoke on us that fits well under his authority, under him. The Jews use this phrase, under the yoke, uh, uh, talking about entering into submission. They spoke of the yoke of the law and the yoke of the commandments, the yoke of the kingdom and the yoke of God. And so when they talked about a yoke, they were talking about being under submission of these things. And so Jesus says, let me put my yoke upon you, submit to me, and I guarantee you it will be light and it will be good for you. And if you're controlled by depression, then hopelessness and negative thoughts are just a pattern of your life. Hopelessness and negative thoughts become the master of your life. And so Jesus says to you, how do we get rid of the master called depression? He says, come to me and make me your master. I love what one author said. He said, when we get saved, he gives us the peace of God so that he gives us, he gives us peace with God so that we can have the peace of God. There's one last thing that I want us to talk about this morning as we talk about depression. And that is this. Jesus says, write this down, learn from me. Jesus says, learn from me. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For some of you, you just need to learn from Jesus so that you can find rest for your soul. You know what's interesting about this, this Greek word right here that's talking about learn from me? It's closely associated with the same word that we get the word disciple. Become my disciple. Learn from me, become a learner of me, become a disciple of me, become a follower of me, and you will find rest for your souls. And that's why this is so important. I just want to encourage you. This is why it's so important for you to be in church. This is why it's so important for you uh, to, to get in a, a Bible study or to read, to read your Bible, to listen to Christian music. This is why that is so important for you is because you're constantly pouring into your life. Let me tell you, you are a leaky bucket, my friends. You are a leaky bucket, and God wants to consistently be pouring into you. Listen to what John MacArthur said. John MacArthur said, submission to Jesus brings the greatest liberation a person can experience. Actually, the only true liberation that he can experience because only through Jesus Christ is he freed to become what God created him to be. Submission to Jesus is how God puts in you and he creates in you and he frees you to be everything that God has called you to be. But it only happens, it only happens when you come to him, when you take his life, not the life that you want, the life that he wants for you, and when you learn from him. 
as we go into a time of invitation, I want to ask for our praise team to come on back up. And I just, I, I came across a story that I th really thought resonated uh, in my heart, and I'm hoping will resonate in yours. During the first part of the 20th century, did you know this? J.C. Penney, it's not just a store, it was actually a man. J.C. Penney was a real man who presided over a very real and powerful empire of 1,700 stores. We have one here, right here in Metairie, a, a, a J.C. Penney. And at the time, listen to this, at the time he had the country's largest chain of department stores, each one bearing his name. It's kind of funny here in the 21st century he has the same thing. But although this enterprise made him incredibly wealthy, what happened was J.C. Penney's life was not a, a void of setbacks and troubles. And uh, in 1929, events took place that nearly cost Penny his life. And as many of y'all know, during that time, something was going on called the Great Depression. The Great Depression, as we talk about depression. The Great Depression took place, and it wasn't just talking about financial depression. There was a depression that came across our country. And one of the things that J.C. Penney did is he was, his business was thriving so much that he took out several loans because he wanted to build more stores and he wanted to do more things. Well, as the Great Depression came, these loan collectors wanted their money. And, and they wanted it quickly and they, they didn't want it in a, in a way that, that they had originally said. And so now they were calling in all of their money. And so what began to happen was, he said this, I was so harassed with the worries that I couldn't sleep and developed an extremely painful ailment. He got depressed. And concerned about his deteriorating health, Penny checked himself in to the Kellogg Sanitarium at Battle Creek, Michigan. And there, there was a, several of the doctors worked with him. A staff uh, physician examined Penny and declared th this. He was extremely ill. And this is what, as Penny described later on, he said, a rigid treatment was prescribed, but nothing helped. He was constantly tormented by periods, listen, listen to this, of hopelessness and despair. Does that sound like depression to you? He said this, I got weaker day by day. I was broken, nervously, physically, filled with despair, unable to see a ray of hope. Remember I was talking about being underwater and unable to see a ray of hope in my life. I had nothing to live for. I felt like I hadn't a friend left in the world and that even my family had turned against me. And so alarmed at his deteriorating uh, condition, the doctors began to give him sedatives began to try to control what was going on and and so he said one night he didn't think that he was going to live until morning and so he got up and one night and he starts writing letters to his wife and to his son because he didn't expect to see the dawn he was so broken he said the next morning jc penny was actually surprised when he opened his eyes and he made it to the dawn the next morning he was surprised to find himself alive. And making his way down the hallway of this hospital, he could hear singing coming from the little chapel where they did devotions every single morning. And the words of the hymn that he heard being sung, they, they just got in his heart. Have you ever had a song that just gets in your heart? And he said, going into the chapel, he listened to the singing and the reading of the scripture and the prayer. And, and this is what he heard. This is the song that he heard. Be not dismayed, whatever betide, because God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, for God will take care of you. God will take care of you, though every day, through every day or all the way, he will take care of you. God will take care of you. And do you know what J.C. Penney recorded? Do you know what he recorded? This is what he said. He said, suddenly something happened. I can't explain it. I can only call it a miracle. I felt as if instantly I was lifted out of this dungeon of darkness into a warm and brilliant sunlight. I felt like I had been transported from hell. And if you've ever been depressed, it's hell to paradise. I felt the power of God as if I had never felt it before. 
And he finished with this last sentence. He said, the most dramatic and glorious 20 minutes of my life were those that I spent in the chapel that morning. Isn't it amazing that the Holy Spirit can do more in our lives in 20 minutes than we can do in 20 years? I want you to know this morning that if you're feeling depression or if you've been through those areas, number one, you're not alone. And number two, God wants to give you freedom like you have never experienced before.